We have one nervous system. We don't have a nervous system of the body and one of the brain. And your description of psychiatry has been a focus on what they call CNS or central nervous system and mental health being really uh, associated with signatures of brain function and then perhaps uh, neurochemical uh, signatures and that leads to a pharmacological treatment model. You can take a different model. And the model is that we have one nervous system and that nervous system when under threat does many different things. Some can be the chemicals that you're seeing, can be shifts in neuroregulation and shifts in mental experiences, and of course, shifts in health. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you or your loved ones suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, stress, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health experts from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal over the long term. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Professor Stephen Porges, I'm so grateful that you're here. and. Dr. Stephen Porges is the founder of the polyvagal theory, which he sort of came up with. I'm sure it was a long process, but in 1994. And I'll read a little bit about your biog, and then I'll launch right in because I have so many questions for you. So Dr. Stephen Porges is a distinguished university scientist at the Kinsey Institute, Indiana University, Bloomington, and professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, which is where my mom is from. Prior to moving to North Carolina, Professor Porges directed the Brain Body Center in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he also held appointments in the Departments of Psychology and Bioengineering and worked as an adjunct in the Department of Neuroscience. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Dr. Porges served as chair of the Department of Human Development and director of the Institute for Child Study. He is a former president of the Society for Psychophysiological Research and has been president of the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, which is a consortium of societies representing approximately 20,000 biobehavioral scientists. It's a lot of scientists. He was a recipient of a National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award. He's chaired the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development Maternal and Child Health Research Committee and was a visiting scientist in the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development Laboratory of Comparative Ethology. He is, as I was saying, the originator of the groundbreaking polyvagal theory and has published more than 300 peer-reviewed scientific papers across several disciplines. And he's here speaking with us um, for Mind Health 360. So thank you, Stephen. And um, what I'd really like to ask is, since the development of this polyvagal theory, it's proved groundbreaking for mental health, you know, quite revolutionary, in fact. And what I'd like you to do, and, you know, I, I know that you've been asked 101 times about what is the polyvagal theory, and you must be incredibly bored with it. And so I'm not even sure we should start there. But what I'd really like to know is how has this polyvagal theory been instrumental in revolutionizing the way we treat mental health, the way we address mental health, or our conception of what mental health is and what it entails? I think that's a better question than asking what the theory is, because we can actually see the applications in examples uh, for, uh, to answer your question. So let's start off with what I think is the contribution in the area of understanding trauma. And that is that it shifts our dialogue from a narrative of a person's history of events to a history of feelings. So we start shifting the emphasis to internal states and how the body changes under various threatening situations and not emphasizing the part that's occurring outside the body or the event. Because many people uh, survive very, very toxic experiences and their bodies are so resilient, they're literally, uh, uh, you know, miraculously pass through it. While others, where the event may not appear to be as toxic, they may be totally retuned, reorganized by the experience. And if you focus on events like with ACEs, which is not a bad thing to start with, you tend to miss uh, those that are on the edges, those that have had, uh, in a sense, not that high number of aces, but their body has been retuned by it. So what we have to do is listen to people when they tell you about their feelings. And as an individual, polyvagal theory 
teaches us to honor what our body is trying to tell us. And in our journey of healthfulness, we start seeing that polyvagal theory is really a theory of embodiment that provides you provides a neurophysiological basis for a brain body or a mind body uh, science. That's really interesting because one of the reasons I started Mind Health 360 is because I was frustrated with the way mental health was being treated, diagnosed and treated. And I felt that, you know, it was too restrictive in terms of both, you know, you could go and have depression or anxiety and you would be giving some, some sort of psych drug or you would be, be giving some talk therapy, for instance. And I felt that they were really missing a trick in terms of taking into account the full spectrum of what impacts us and what impacts our mental health, notably the body. And that's why the tagline is head to toe mental health, because essentially I feel that, you know, it's very body based. And so I discovered or, you know, this thing was out there called functional medicine psychiatry or integrative mental health, which looked at all the biochemical aspects of mental health from, you know, disruption in the hormonal system to the gut, to toxin levels, to inflammation, etc. And I thought, ah, this is the solution, you know, to, to mental health is to take into account these other biochemical processes that we've so far, you know, that we ignore. I mean, we go to a psychiatrist and we're never given a stool test or a hormone test or we're not talked to about our nutrition. And then I discovered your work and the work of the nervous system. And I thought, okay, well, how does this fit in to the whole integrative picture in terms of both of them are body-based, but, you know, I'm very interested in the link between your work and functional medicine psychiatry. And so would you say that, you know, effects on the neurophysiology, so essentially the polyvagal theory from my understanding sees mental health issues as a dysregulation in the neurophysiology and imbalance in the neurophysiology and in, in the nervous system. Yeah, you know, so I, I would kind of, uh, I would say, yeah, unpack what you're saying and see it on a more, start with a more metaphoric level of interpretation. And I would start off by saying we have one nervous system. We don't have a nervous system of the body and one of the brain. And your description of psychiatry has been a focus on what they call CNS or central nervous system and mental health being really uh, associated with signatures of brain function and then perhaps uh, neurochemical uh, signatures and that leads to a pharmacological treatment model. And I'm saying something somewhat different. I'm not saying that those indices aren't useful, but I'm saying metaphorically and in the organizational patterns, you can take a different model. And the model is that we have one nervous system, and that nervous system, when under threat, does many different things. Some can be the chemicals that you're seeing, can be shifts in neuroregulation, and shifts in mental experiences, and of course, shifts in health. And so with a one nervous system model, we don't have psychiatry on one side and internal medicine on the other. We have an informed, neurally informed practice of medicine which recognizes the bi-directionality and if you embody that type of metaphor then social interactions talk therapy and even compassion become a neurobiological treatment interesting and so essentially when you do talk therapy when you do cognitive behavioral therapy you know i mean I think it can be very useful and it has been very useful, but how, how does it get to, or does it get to the underlying physiology? And this is, this is my question because it's very cognitive. And so you can talk about your mental health problems until your the cows come home, but how do you get to that underlying dysregulation and the physiology that you talk about in your book, which is, you know, a sort of response to past events or past as you say, AC, adverse childhood experiences, and that sort of get embedded. And I don't know if you would call it cellular memory or how does that trauma get stored? And then how does talking about that actually help or does it help? We, we have to shift the metaphor. And in a sense, so we'll take what you're saying, but we'll put it on the side for a moment. And we have to shift the metaphor and really saying, when we talk about mental health disorders, they're not independent or orthogonal to disruptions of bodily function. So that when we see people in states of anxiety or being anxious, there's a physiological substrate to that which is very much like a generalized threat response to the body. So it will be a neurochemical 
correlated this to be a, a variety of others. But if we had the metaphor that our body reacts to challenges by disrupting homeostatic function, supporting health, growth, and restoration, we'd have a different metaphor. We'd say if my body is in a state of threat, it's preparing itself to defend. Defense is great for short periods of time, but defense under chronic states of mobilization or immobilization are chronic disruptors of homeostatic function, which means target means that your end organs are going to show dysfunction, your gut, your heart, your vascular system. And the problem we have is that we really want to concretize mental health as a discrete disease, and then we start looking for comorbidities. But if we took a one nervous system model, we would see the adaptive function of that nervous system in responding to threat or responding to cues of safety. So as we respond to threat, we get all the features that people talk about, about chronic anxiety, chronic stress, toxic stress. The body is in a state of defense. Well, what are the treatments to take the body out of a state of defense if you have an integrated whole body, one nervous system model? Well, you have to give the body cues that it's safe. And what's the evolution of uh, mammals, let alone humans, is that cues of safety come from connectedness with other people, uh, interactions with other, co-regulation, being held while being accessible and not being defensive of others. So talk therapy. Now, we had what you were talking about. Talk therapy becomes one of those portals of two people in an interaction being mutually present for each other and in a sense down-regulating uh, cues of threat and replacing them now with cues of safety and connectedness. And when cues of safety and connectedness work, the body shifts state. And then the range of psychological phenomena that you can deal with expands. And we call those types of people more resilient. So, But the issue is they're really reflecting the underlying physiological state of their body, which has adaptive functions, and some of those adaptive functions are to respond to threat. So we basically depathologize mental health by saying that much of what we call mental illness or mental uh, dis disorders, mental health disorders, are really a reflection of a body in a state of defense. And if the body shifts that state of defense, then things become more welcoming and accessible. But when we talk about the body shifting state of defense, that's not independent of the brainstem structures that are the regulator of the body. So the body is really our observables of how the brain and the nervous system are working. And the, uh, let's say, the naive approach over decades was to say, if it's below the neck, it's irrelevant to mental health. And we send you now to another uh, physician but if the other physician doesn't find any end organ damage, that patient will be referred back to a psychiatrist because it must be in the head. In a one nervous system model, what the mental health is telling you is an early precursor of the end organ damage because it's telling you that the homeostatic functions are not working right. And I, I want to tell you that what I'm talking about as a one nervous system model is far from radical. It, in 1949, a person got a Nobel Prize for this. His name was Walter Hess for actually articulating that the brain was the regulator of our visceral organs and that the visceral organs impacted on the brain. And that's 70 years ago. And where are we today? So why is that? I mean, why do you think we are not further along today? I mean, why is it that our state of treating mental health is frankly quite well, bankrupt? Our um, state of treating health is bankrupt. And the issue is the metaphor, which was useful in the early 1900s in concretizing and making medicine scientific-based or evidence-based, didn't grow. And so it, it, as people were discovering units of the body, like the autonomic nervous system, they're still being taught in medical school about the autonomic nervous system the way it was taught in 1920. And in 1920, they didn't talk about the autonomic nervous system as having a brain regulator. They didn't talk about it as having a surveillance or a sensory system. They talked about it merely as having motor fibers because they were discovering the organization of the motor fibers. They didn't go beyond it in terms of building their model. If they had built the model 
they would have used the information in diagnosis and understanding trajectory of health and treatment, meaning they would have emphasized the sensory part of the autonomic nervous system, which is your surveillance, your monitoring system of your organs. And rather than wait for the organs to be infected or diseased or dysfunctional, they would see the antecedent shifts in the neural regulation of those organs as a red flag to change something in that person's life. But the model became identify the end organ damage, develop a drug for the end organ, or do surgical procedures on the end organ. And that's what medicine is today. The issue is drugs for an end organ is really a pipe dream because the chemicals that communicate with the organs uh, are not specific to one organ. We have kind of general communication uh, chemicals called neurotransmitters, and they are not usually not specific to one organ. They're specific to the total autonomic nervous system. So that's why we have, in a sense, many symptoms often where a a person who, let's say, let's say a trauma survivor, starts rep having issues of cardiovascular, vascular issues, and especially gut issues, and they just get sent to different specialists because they're looking at the end organ. They're not looking at the neural regulation of these organs and why they have shifted into a state that results in damage to them because they're in states of defense. And the bottom, the bottom line is the autonomic nervous system in a state of defense does not support our health growth and restoration. So what should medicine be? Medicine should be all about getting our autonomic nervous system out of states of defense so it just supports our homeostatic functions, meaning health, growth, and restoration. And in doing that, it sends signals to the brain saying, hey, you're safe. Absolutely. Well, that's absolutely, I mean, that's very beautiful. And I completely agree, but it's quite interesting because essentially what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that essentially the state of your nervous system mm -hmm. is the fundamental bedrock of health, essentially. And well, it, well, let's say it's a bedrock of health, but it's the bedrock of how we react to the world. So we talk about health as a consequence of how we react. Our physiological state is the biaser of how we respond to the world. Are we accessible? Do we welcome mm -hmm. things into our world? Or are we defensive? defensive? So as I move my hands open, you feel the difference of accessibility. And this you're very familiar with. If I pull my hands in, I am basically protecting my ventral side. And ventral sides of mammals are very, very vulnerable. And if you have a puppy or a dog, and you know when the dog is really comfortable with you, they'll go on their back and have you rub their, their belly. In a sense, they're showing their ventral side, which is a signal of total trust. And this is how we function if we go up and give you a hug. If your body spontaneously conforms to mine, you're being accessible. If your body reactively, not through a conscious intention, becomes rigid, you're picking up cues of, of vulnerability and you become defensive so let me ask you a couple of things um first of all um you know i think what you're saying is you you have to get to the root cause essentially of what dysregulates health and and you've you you that's you know what you've just explained and that really rejoins functional medicine which is all about root cause and the optimal functioning of organs essentially it's like don't intervene once they're diseased intervene when they start to get out of balance but what i'm also interested in is for instance you know if somebody is treated in a neurophysiological way and um they uh, use sort of polyvagal informed therapy to help with their trauma and their nervous system and get them out of defense and out of mobilization into a state of sort of social, social engagement, essentially. I mean, you can do that till the cows come home, but what if there is an actual biochemical issue such mm. as a mold, you know, uh, toxin or a Lyme disease or an inflammation caused by, you know, a food intolerance or something that is really biochemical? Let's, again, rewind or unpack 
And first of all, say there are things like viruses and infections. There are issues in which there is really an end organ damage or end organ threat that is not totally uh, mediated by a one nervous system model or neural regulation. Uh, but that being said, let's ask this question. Why do some people become infected and other people not? Why are certain people's immune system more, in a sense, adaptive to the environment while others are misreading the cues and having uh, inflammation in uh, basically buildings or are reacting uh, to uh, allergic reactions where their body is overreacting to an insult? And it's another metaphor of a defensive model where the body is defending and trying to do its job. So there's nothing wrong with being defensive, but there's a range of levels of, uh, or let's say thresholds. So again, as we do the metaphor of accessibility versus vulnerability, we can take that metaphor and we can move it to all levels of the human body, all levels of the nervous system, all levels of uh, chemical imbalance, uh, it, does, it doesn't matter. The, the real question when you start talking about chemical imbalance, you have to go back and say, what is the regulator of the chemical imbalance? Where is that information in the, in the nervous system being regulated and adjusted? So in a sense, the question in a polyvagal informed world goes to where is the regulator? And if I get cues of safety to that regulator, do I now allow that system to be more resilient and more accessible? Understood. And so essentially the, you know, the nervous system is utterly crucial in terms of ensuring health because, you know, whether it's because you're responding to a stressor in a way that's maybe overactive and you're getting over inflamed or your body is responding to that stressor and it's triggering cues of, of, danger essentially and so it's triggering your whole nervous system and so w would you say that using the sort of polyvagal informed therapy and using the nervous system approach you you can pretty much deal with any sort of ailment whether it's mental health or physical health in a much more productive way because essentially you're enabling the body to heal itself i like what you're saying so what i my term is that you recruit the nervous system to be your collaborator in your journey to wellness. And, and this now goes back at how do we, uh, how does the medical world treat its patients, its constituency? It does it in a world of assessment and judgment. And all we need to do is ask, if you feel like you're being judged all the time, what is your body doing? It becomes immediately defensive. Our bodies are human experiences. We really don't like to be evaluated, but we like information. So if we change the narrative in medicine from assessments to shared journeys and monitoring and learning about our body, then suddenly the medical process becomes very different. So you go in, you get a, a, a basically a lipid bat battery, or you get a whole set of others. If you have had uh, cancer, they're going to measure different things to see if it's coming back. And you wait with great expectations. You want those numbers to look good. If they're marginal, you feel uncomfortable. If they're bad, you're now frightened because now you don't know, you have chaos in your world because you don't know how this can be treated. This is not the right approach to inviting the body to be your collaborator. The irony is that there's actually quite a bit of research floating on the periphery saying that if your body is in more state safe, a state safe, safe states, you will be more resilient even to things like prostate cancer or breast cancer. So there's research out there on heart rate variability, which is telling you something about how much the vagal regulation of the autonomic nervous system is functioning. And this is the calming part of your autonomic nervous system. And if you have more vagal regulation in general, the Gleason scores, which are severity of cancer, become less predictive of outcome. But if you have low uh, vagal regulation, they become destiny. So the issue is uh, a autonomic nervous system that is reading the cues of the environment and relationships to support its homeostatic function does better even in you know, very high risk uh, disease states. 
And so that it's an example of the, this metaphor of recruiting the nervous system as a collaborator. If we scare people, you know, then we'll, we'll, we know who lives and who dies based on those numbers, based on those assessment tests. That's so interesting. And, you know, and especially at the moment with the whole coronavirus thing, we, you know, we're all trying desperately to make sure that our immune systems are strong so that we don't, you know, get sick, essentially. And, and part of that is regulating our nervous system. It, the, the pandemic is, okay, I use the word beautiful, but I mean it, it's much more of a rhetorical type statement because it's pulling the veil off of our own vulnerability and it's teaching us about what it is to be a human being. So we're on the virus is a threat and our bodies react. So many of us become more irritable, less optimistic about things. And those who are, let's say younger, who have their kids living in the house, who have to work at home, who have financial stressors, it's kind of an overwhelming experience, but it, it's not. And then there are the few, the you know, the couples who have enough money and they're getting a chance to be with each other and enjoy each other. But that's really on the rare part of, of the spectrum. The issues are we're affected by the threat of the virus, and that does change our body. And through the whole history of humanity, how have humans attempted to regulate when they were under threat? They've attempted to regulate their bodily state through connecting with others, through co-regulation, through embracing, to being in close proximity. But guess what happened with the pandemic? Those options now become threats. So it's a paradox. The experience is literally paradoxical for our nervous system. We want to reach out and be next to other people, but that normal mitigator of our threat state is also becomes a threat state. It's sort of a perfect storm. And and regarding the coronavirus, it's quite interesting. That brings me to two points. One of them is you were talking in your book about how the vagus is a regulator of the cardiopulmonary system to an extent, and that you know it dictates the the sort of blood flow and the rhythm of the blood flow, and and therefore the oxygen that gets into the blood cells. And it's quite interesting because you know in your whole polyvagal theory, you talk a lot about the fact that when you go into dorsal vagal, so shut down, there's then possibly a lack of oxygen, and that's why people will pass out or they'll sort of have dissociative states. And one of the interesting things is that apparently, you know, this, this coronavirus creates states of hypoxia. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the vagus you know, because it does regulate the cardiopulmonary state, or if you have any views on that. Well, it, it probably has a lot to do. We're doing a, um, we're collecting some data. A colleague from Iran has sent us some data of, from COVID-19 of people where, where this scientist collected the heart rate data to get a measures of vagal tone and what I now call another measure of vagal efficiency. And we are looking at her data and the vagal efficiency is predicting outcome. Meaning that if they're more, if the vagal system is more effectively regulating the heart, then the outcomes are much better. I don't have all the data, but it's really saying if, if you thought of it another, let's say a lower level metaphor, and that is if the homeostatic function is efficiently regulating your, your autonomic nervous system, you're going to do better. You're going to be able to deal with those challenges and you're going to survive. But if you don't have that resource, then your body gets triggered into lower and lower levels of defense, which will then lead to shutting down or hypoxia. So the part with the hypoxia is the impact on both the vascular system and the lungs with COVID-19. And uh, the issue is, can you get to the nervous system with cues of safety? And will that then mitigate some of the disaster effects. I'm in a dialogue with a physician in Ireland about using the SSP in the ICU, the safe and sound protocol, the acoustic system I developed, which is actually an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator because melodic voices change our physiological state and enhance vagal regulation to see if that can be used as an adjunct therapy within the ICUs for COVID-19. 
That's such a great idea. I mean, yeah, that would be absolutely brilliant because, I mean, that was going to be my next question is how do you increase vagal tone or vagal efficiency, as you're now calling it? And one of the ways, obviously, is the device that you developed, the SSP, Safe and Sound Protocol, and which, from my understanding, you know, impacts sort of the muscles in your inner ear. And, I mean, you, you can explain this a lot better. Simply, it's cues of safety. And when you hear cues of safety, like the melodic... Uh, uh, intonation of a mother's lullaby, the body says, I'm going to give up those defenses. The baby says, I'm giving up defenses. I'm safe in the arms of my mother. Well, it's wired into us. And if you have a dog or a cat, you will talk to them like a baby with this melodic voice and they will just relax as well. So within many mammalian species, there's a frequency band that our nervous system can't reject. It says this is safety. And the Safe and Sound Protocol takes that frequency band and amplifies the intonation changes. So it's like amplifying prosody. And the body says, I'm safe. And what that means, it can turn off those defenses, sympathetic excitation and mobilization responses, and become more homeostatic and relaxed. But there's a paradox here, especially with people who have trauma histories. Because once the body becomes relaxed, it becomes accessible, but with someone with a trauma history, accessibility is vulnerability. So the cues of the body becoming open like that become cues of vulnerability, and then there's a reaction. And we're learning that with people with, with, uh, who are survivors of trauma, you have to titrate this slowly so that their body starts to welcome feelings of being safe again. And if we think about what is trauma therapy all about, it's about the survivor with having a great desire to feel safe in the arms of another, to be able to connect, to trust again. And then the difficulties in the therapy is the difficulties of feelings of violation of trust or cues of violation of trust. So we're trying to get at it outside the discussion or talking about it other than the talking about how my body is reacting to that intonation of vocalizations and understanding that as the body reacts and vulnerability, you now have the narrative, you now have the respect of what your body is trying to do. And the next step is by understanding that, does the understanding in itself downregulate the defensiveness? So. It's very interesting because one of the things that I always find slightly uh, confusing about your social engagement system is um, personally, I find people quite draining and I find, I mean, I love people and I, I love connecting with people, but then there are moments where I really need to be on my own and I find that I actually regulate better on my own meditating or breathing or, you know, and a lot of the things that you mention in your book, which help with vagal tone. So whether it's singing or gargling or playing an instrument, a wind instrument or you know, even walking in nature to an extent, but these are things that you can do alone. And so I sometimes think, you know, what if people find social engagement a threat in some sense, which is essentially what you're saying. And well, is there not the possibility of having a, a social engagement with yourself in some sense? So, you know, when in therapy, we talk about connecting to ourselves mm -hmm. and intimacy with the self is actually a fundamental tenant of intimacy with another. Well, I would agree with everything you're saying. And basically what you're saying is if you're not safe or embodied in yourself, you can't be a good co-regulator. You're not going to be universally or predictably safe with another. And the other part is that there is nothing wrong or uh, about being a self-regulator. Uh, and that's fine, but it, it, what it often does is it provides a resource for you to then be a co-regulator. So, so it, it's like, in general, it's usually the ver reverse. So if we watch development of children. They are part of a co-regulatory unit that gives them the resource to be self-regulatory and then to be bold and exploratory, but they can always go back to their parents, or at least metaphorically, for that uh, secure base or that really is a co-regulator. So the part is, you're telling me that you're aware of your own body and you're listening to the cues, and in many ways, we use the word you're honoring 
what your body is telling you. And in doing that, you will find that over time, you will gain more resilience because you won't make mistakes. See, this notion is that uh, you didn't do it in the past or you didn't do it and you got overwhelmed. And then you become aware of it and you say, oh, this is so bad. I'll, I'll move my body when it gets into this state into a place of, let's say, solitude and I will appreciate uh, being still. I'll appreciate stillness. I'll appreciate myself. And that's fine. I, I like to always bring another metaphor and talk about this continuum from of how people interpret stillness. So uh, for some of us, stillness is really what we want to achieve in our lives because it's the moments or when time expands and we can be creative and we can go different places and, that, and we're safe to do that. But other people, when you talk to them about stillness, they get frightened and they say, I have to keep moving. And that's extraordinarily polyvagal because to them, stillness is shutting down. It's not immobilization uh, without fear where you have shared moments of intimacy or where you have even shared moments of intimacy and connectedness, even if the person's not there. It's immobilization is so close to death fainting and they feel they're going into the pits of hell. And so you have to have that respect. But asking people that question and allowing them to articulate gives you an understanding of their strategies in life. So people who can't immobilize without fear or can't deal with stillness are going to always try to keep doing things, high-risk behaviors, addictive-type behaviors. They can't work a holic. They won't be able to, to, to sit down and appreciate the moment. And that's, you know, and that's really interesting because I think in some ways our societies are primed to mobilization. I mean, we're, you know, our whole culture is about mobilization and getting things done. And, you know, in some ways stillness is not really um, valued. And I think, but the problem is, you know, it's become almost pathological in our societies in the sense that, you know, there's a sense of needing to run and, and as you say, needing to mobilize the whole time. And, you know, and some people, maybe the only time that they do slow down is when they're co-regulating with other people when they're in social situations. Maybe that's why it's important. Yeah. I'm interested also in, in terms coming back to the sort of whole mental health dilemma and, you know, how you would explain, you know, mental health disorders per se. And I know we don't like calling them disorders, but things like ADHD or anxiety, depression, OCD, autism, from the perspective of the polyvagal theory. I mean, you know, we have the DSM-5, which explains all these different disorders, over 300 of them. Would you say that all of those disorders, quote unquote, you could explain from a polyvagal perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, polyvagal theory would approach it very differently. It would basically think of the uh, brain as an inverted triangle. The cortex is across the top, but this little area down below is the brainstem. And the brainstem is what regulates all these physiological states. So you'll find common physiological states across a broad variety of mental health disorders since they're trying to define the mental health disorders at a higher level of the brain. So it, we can start like with ADHD. And the real feature about that is state regulation and the body being in tune to a more chronic state of defense. And so if you see it that way, it's not a voluntary, you know, if you have impulsivity, and, and it's not necessarily a voluntary behavior, it's a physiological state that's being manifested externally, and it's also biased to respond to cues of threat. So with ADHD, you'll have a hypervigilance, a distractibility, you'll also have auditory hypersensitivities because the nervous system is now tuned the body to detect predator. So, the, so a polyvagal perspective is first to understand uh, the underlying autonomic brainstem regulatory system that creates that state and then ask the question, can you downregulate that state and, and what are the emergent properties? If Can you downregulate with cues of safety? Can you downregulate it through context, through types of interactions? And then you see 
what is left? Is there still an ADHD? If you move to autism, you have some of the same features. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can cure autism, but many of the features are sensory features. And those are sensory features also that are tuned for defense. And if you look at the autonomic state of autistic individuals, their bodies are primed to be defensive. So if you change that, what happens to the autistic individual? Do they become spontaneously engaging? Um, and so some of the features that have historically been viewed as uh, basically central or gen central nervous system or genetic features of autism may actually be extraordinarily flexible. And if you get rid of those, or let's say you're able to modify those, what happens to the quality of life of that individual and their family? And so it doesn't mean that you take away all the features of the disorder, but you start now dealing with some of the features that are state-related that you can now regulate. If we move to a more general area, and this is a, I was talking uh, this past fall at a conference on neuroscience and education, and I asked this basic question, and this is really elementary through uh, high school teachers. I said, what would your world be like if, state reg if, if there wasn't a problem of behavioral state regulation in your classroom? Mm -hmm. And of course, the world would be very different. And then you ask the next question, and is how much time has been spent in your training and education to understand state regulation? Zero. And what are the tools that you have? Well, you have behavior modification. And behavior modification is also physiological. Physi it's a physiological state-dependent process. So if your body's in a state of defense, behavior mod doesn't work very well. If your body's in a state of safety, yeah, it's not a bad uh, technology. But if you're mobilized, it's just not going to work. And that's why it's been very ineffective in reducing uh, adversive type behaviors, especially in hyperactivity or in autism. Yeah, and I mean, the sad thing is that a lot of kids are put on, on drugs, you know, for ADHD, essentially. So Yeah, you know, and, and they're put on drugs for autism, in, if they have autism. And th there's a double edge here. The drug does down, drugs do downregulate some of the self injurious and aversive behaviors, but they also interfere with some of the co regulatory uh, synchronous behaviors that we uh, see as being part of the truly human experience. And then one other thing that I was very interested in when I was reading about your sort of triangle and the fact that what I hadn't realized is that 80% of your vagal nerve, you know, fibers go up. So they're sensory or afferent as opposed to going from the brainstem down to your visceral organs. They go from your visceral organs to your brainstem. And that was fascinating because our societies are so geared towards cognition. And, you know, since the age of enlightenment, I mean, we're told that, you know, it's reason above all else and cognition and thoughts that dictate feelings and that feelings shouldn't even really be taken into account. And what I love about your theory is that it really puts the, you know, sensory perceptions, which then lead to feelings in the limbic system, which then lead to thoughts in that order, as opposed to the order that our society tends to have it. And I, I much prefer your order. And I think what your order preconizes is essentially, a, a, a you know, taking much more seriously into account not only our bodily sensations, but also our feelings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to me, that's one of the most important things about this polyvagal theory is, is rebalancing from the cognitive to the sensory. Yeah, well, it's basically respecting your body. And if you think about Western civilization and whether you're in the UK, the US, it's basically the same. And uh, being taught to not listen to your body, in a sense, that's part of the mandate. Uh, whether you're a child or as you grow up or you're working, it's about inhibiting and sitting on top of what your body's trying to tell you because the viewpoint is if you listen to it, you won't amount to anything. You, you, in a sense, you'll let the body take charge, and that's horrible. And the answer is you need to respect the body. And as we talk about bottom-up and this powerful influence of that, those sensory, that sensory information, 
we have to recognize that we are a bi-directional organism. That with that information coming up, we can restructure our narrative with respect for our body needs. So it doesn't mean we spend our whole day just playing out in the grass, but we understand that we know we need to get out, we need to walk, we need to be with other people. It's part of our heritage. But if we can take care of that, and if that helps us regulate who we are, we then have that potential to be creative and to express ourselves. So that's this whole uh, regulatory behavior. Uh, what I wanted to kind of tie this together with uh, when I when I mentioned that we were living in a world that treated the autonomic nervous system as as if it were 1920, and in 1920, the way that the medical world was uh, concretizing and defining the autonomic nervous system, and the term autonomic nervous system was coined in 1920. So this is a relative in the history of science and, and physiology, relatively new. And it was coined, the first book or major book was by a person by the name of Langley. And in his book, all he talks about are the motor fibers. He doesn't say there aren't sensory fibers, and he doesn't say there's not a brainstem regulatory one, but he says there are motor fibers, and he is now describing them. But the uh, medical world just said, okay, that's it. It's just uh, motor fibers. But also in his book, he has some really interesting statements because he noticed that some of the motor fibers were myelinated and some were not myelinated. And in the vagal system, myelinated fibers are the newer circuit that enables us to calm down, to regulate, and communicate with cues of safety. While the older vagus, the unmyelinated one, the evolutionary older one, uh, basically is, when not under threat, supports homeostasis, but when under threat, shuts us down. But in his book, he says, well, maybe, or it appears that those myelinated ones are evolutionarily newer. So basically he is uh, telling the polyvagal theory story in 1920. Uh, which that's is, so, that's interesting. And I, it would, from my perspective, it was extraordinarily interesting because I spent several decades saying the guy poisoned the water by talking about it as only a motor system. And about four years ago, I went back and reread his original book. And I said, this guy is on a journey and this was the first step. The point was no one went beyond that. That's so interesting. And also in terms of myelinated, myelinated and unmyelinated, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if the nerve system is myelinated, the nervous sort of impulses travel faster and easier. Is that correct? And well, if think about a coaxial or insulated cable. Mm. Well, you know, it's kind of like uh, everyone taps into the internet. It's a coaxial cable with fast communication. So it's not only fast, it can actually send more complex signals through it. And being fast enables it in our own metaphor as being more tightly a pathway that can more tightly regulate the end organ. Yeah. So it can, it can inhibit, it can send this vagal influence that slows our heart rate up and then it can rapidly retract it and suddenly our heart rate goes up 20 or 30 beats and we run up a flight of steps. But when we come back down, it calms us down because if it stayed up there with a high heart rate, we'd be, we'd be reactive to the world because the afferents are telling our brainstem and our brainstem is communicating that up to our cortex that you're highly mobilized. Now, it makes sense of that. You're highly yeah. mobilized probably because someone uh, you know, uh, pissed you off, got you upset, got you angry. Or if you're really smart, you're mobilized because you walked up a flight of steps. But most people don't realize that they take their bodily state and they leverage it in their social interaction. They leverage it for their motivation. So anxiety becomes their motivator. Uh, uh, if it gets worse, they are, become slightly paranoid and blame other people for their feelings. Uh, so we use these feelings to structure narratives in which we are being ab abused or being heroic. And we can structure a different narrative when we really understand the signal. And we can see what our body is trying to do for us. And we honor the body before we develop that narrative.
And that's one of the things I love about what you were saying is that, you know, we always see um, sort of victims of, of trauma and abuse who feel very ashamed by the fact that they haven't been yeah. able to mobilize or that they've shut down. And, you know, I think you've done a huge service to the whole world of trauma by saying, actually, it's your body trying to protect you and you should be grateful rather yeah. than ashamed because, you know, it's done you a service. It's allowed you to survive essentially by shutting down. I've received numerous emails from survivors telling me that story. And it's like, wow. And it's like, uh, I didn't develop the story for any specific reason. The story was that's because of how we're wired. But now with that knowledge, we understand what we're doing. And it, in the area of, uh, of court system, judicial work, especially with rape survivors, it becomes a really important issue of understanding why and when people fight or don't fight. And polyvagal theory is entering into that dialogue. That's very interesting. And you can actually use it legally. And, yeah. you know, the interesting thing also is, you know, in terms of our societies, one of the questions I'd love to ask you is, you know, if you had a polyvagally informed society, you know, what would that look like? Because part of the problem, as you point out, is that our societies are very predicated on competition and on getting ahead and on achievement and on, you know, rather than a respect for our sort of physiology and our need to co-regulate and to be cooperative. And I love the sort of vision that you have of a polyvagally informed society. Well, it's, it's, it's um, I'm being empowered to talk more and more about it. And really, it's uh, the respect of who we are as humans. Part of the reason we're in such a constrained worldview is that we really don't like who we are. So we're, or the core of what it is to be a human. But we can see, even during the pandemic, the core of people, and it's really remarkable. It's loving, it's caring, it's supporting of others. And we need to have a greater respect of that as opposed to saying, if I am caring about others, I'm a fool. I should be taking care of myself. Because we're missing what it is to be a human. And being a human is this capacity to co-regulate, to share moments or share thoughts or share feelings. And what happens when you build that base upward? What is a safe world? We're so focused on removing threat in the world that we've spent no time thinking about what are the cues of safety. And our society is really bankrupt on that level because even if we start looking at you know, a, uh, more historical societies or ancient history, we see the appreciation of aesthetics. We see that towns were made to be walked through. Not everyone had the privilege of walking through those towns. But those who had the privilege had the experience of an environment that was supportive. And we need to start thinking about how do we make environments have the cues that enable our bodies to feel safe. This means environments can't be too noisy. We're so a uh, bit with you know carbon footprint, uh, you know uh, stuff in the air. What noise is in the air? And industrial world bothers us. The mechanicals of buildings are chronic disruptors of our physiological state. We want the cues to be calm and quiet so that we can be in our body and not defending about what's outside us. And it's the same also in schools and hospitals and, yeah. you know, therapist offices. And I mean, you make this point really well that, you know, places where in schools where you want access to your higher brain so that you can learn and so that children can feel safe enough to learn and to be creative and instead you know schools can be places of sort of competition or you know quite noisy same with hospitals same with therapist offices and i think yeah, everything has its narrative so like hospitals say we have to be clean we have to have surveillance schools say we have to uh discipline uh, the it, it's it, in schools if we think about that for a moment what has been removed from the curriculum? Opportunities of social engagement and co-regulation. Opportunities for regulating physiological state. We take that out of the classroom. And we say we need more cognitive demands. But we're making those cognitive demands on bodies that can't self-regulate. So as they have more opportunities to play and develop skills of co-regulation, which happens to be play, then they can sit for longer periods of time. And when they sit, 
they can more efficiently process the information. So what I'm really saying is we're, we're not very informed about how we structure our institutions. And they could be more polyvagal informed, which is really saying more nervous system informed and with a greater understanding that our nervous system shifts states. And none of those states are bad states. They have states that have a, literally a platform for different emergent behaviors. And if we want to create emergent behaviors for socialization, for learning, uh, we better have a safe state. If we want uh, a platform for warriors, we have to be careful because in training them, we want them to be engaged. But when they have to fight, they have to be mobilized. So there's all these complicated overlays of this engine of mobilization. And we have to understand there are going to be times when our body will functionally go into a, a shutting down phase because it has to conserve its resources uh, because it's under severe life threat. And also, I mean, I think, you know, one of the points also you make in your book, which I think is fascinating, is the fact that, you know, we always think of the sympathetic nervous system as being sort of the bad guy. But actually, if you pair it up with social engagement, it leads to the play. And so your point about, you know, having an environment in a school that's more playful, which mm -hmm. essentially mobilizes that sympathetic nervous system, but with social engagement, it's the perfect place to it's, practice that. It's the perfect place because the social engagement recruits the vagal break and the vagal break inhibits the sympathetic and suddenly you now have this neural exercise of self-regulation and that's what play is about. And so we don't really understand the value of play and we've commercialized it as a individualized play with computers and that's not what our body wants. Our body wants movement and inhibition of movement. And as adults, dance becomes uh, adult mode of child play. It's movement and communication through movement. Walking and talking become the same. Team sports is really a remarkable social communication while mobilizing. So we have all these opportunities, and we really tend not to understand what those opportunities are for. And one of the things that I got to ask you when you mentioned computers, I mean, you know, my son who's 14 is a computer, complete computer addict. And one of the things you talk about is how people co-regulate with objects rather than with humans. And this is a real problem. And more and more with smartphones and people who are addicted to technology, which is frankly the majority of people, there's a sort of disconnection from human interaction and an over-connection with these objects. And what sort of advice would you give to parents in terms of trying to do polyvagal informed parenting, mm. especially when it comes to technology addiction in children and, and adolescents? So first of all, I wouldn't frighten parents. and I wouldn't frighten people in the society. We're a very fluid species, meaning that we can be object-oriented, but with the appropriate cues, we can move to being people-oriented. So the issue is, uh, if you want to get your child uh, away from the computer, you really have to ask the child what are the motivating factors that he would like or she would like to do other than sit in front of a screen. Now, what we're finding with, with research with college-age students is that if they have a history of some type of maltreatment, they will spend more time, whether they're males or females, uh, in front of a two-dimensional screen uh, versus exercise or physical exercise. So trauma history is negatively related to physical exercise and positively related to more time in front of uh, so social media and media. So the bridge is what can you do that is active to bring a child on board to do things that is somewhat cooperative? Uh, what types of play dates? Or perhaps even interacting with, with a dog. Dogs are tremendous. Uh, they're very gifted co-regulators and they have a very well attuned neuroception they're detecting the physiological states of others and they will in a sense therapeutically interact with others so uh getting if a child who likes to use computers would also like a pet it's going to help that'll help but i mean i still think you know uh, sometimes i i see these young people and my son in particular who does regulate with 
his mm -hmm. computer. And he also has a very wide social network. So he is socializing while he's gaming, but it's not face to face socializing. So, it's, so, so there, it does was, regulate him. Yeah. There was a quote that I had in one of my talks, and it was from a book that Helen Fisher. Uh, wrote or it was an interview with her and it was it, it was a quote from a, a an 18 year old or someone who didn't want to go on dates because it took time away from <laughs> computers and actually described yeah. it it says you know it basically saying in terms of his motivational system it was a waste of time so you have to start asking children a little bit more about what their motivational system is what they want to achieve or what to has to be on a positive journey. I think, especially during the pandemic, parents' perspective of computers uh, or kids playing computer games has suddenly become uh, wonderful. You know, it's like, it's, you know, with <laughs> the child doesn't bother me, I can get my work done. So, and there was, you know, I think it was the WHO, uh, the WHO, who put out something saying that video gaming during the pandemic was actually okay, you know, because yeah. it allowed kids to socialize. Well, it allows them to socialize on one level, but it allows them to regulate themselves and not be irritable or as reactive to their parents who are not used to having young children in their space all the time. You've spent so much time, and I, I don't want to take much more of your time, and you've been amazing, but I just have a couple of other questions. One of them was about sort of the overlap with the functional medicine side of things. I'm very interested in the gut-brain connection, um, and I know that this is an area of you know, increasing research, but also it's increasingly getting into the mainstream medical um, sort of system, but it's not yet the case that when you go to a psychiatrist, you get a stool test analyzing what sort of bacteria you have in your gut, but I do think that will happen in the next 10 years. But t tell me about the impact of sort of the gut microbiome on the vagus, you know, or I, I presume there's a sort of bi-directional yeah. relationship. And I'm curious about that because a lot of our neurotransmitters get made in the gut. And so I'm interested in sort of the impact of the vagus on the gut microbiome, but also in terms of neurotransmitters and inflammation, which also mm. has a lot to do with the gut. So sort of the biochemistry of the vagus and the polyvagal system and the bi-directional polyvagal system between sort of the gut inflammation and the, the microbiome and neurotransmitters. Okay, so basically if you think of the vagus in the gut as being primarily sensory, it's picking up features of the biome, it's picking up a lot of the uh, peptides and hormones, it's detecting this issue. And it's also in terms of inflammation and, and immune responses, uh, the vagus is a uh, major regulator of the immune system. So if we think about it, all these systems as being parts of feedback loops. The immune system and the vagus is really a feedback system. The microbiome in the vagus is also part of a feedback system, meaning that it's sending information up to the brainstem, but the brainstem now is sending information down and the interesting part of the enteric nervous system is that this myelinate vagus may do very little to the gut directly, but may be sending a signal to the gut saying everything's okay. This is actually my perspective of what's going on with the uh, fibers from the more ventral vagus is that it's not regulating your gut. That's coming from the older dorsal vagus, but it's telling the enteric system everything's good. But if this system now gets retracted, which facilitates the defense, it's now sending a signal to the gut saying, basically, hold it in because you have to inhibit uh, digestive processes to mobilize. So it's uh, creating constipation. Now, if the system goes to another level and where the dorsal vagus says, I'm now in trouble, I need to shut down, then it's going to trigger diarrhea and defecation because... Maintaining food in the gut is metabolically costly, and, our, and due to evolutionary history, when under threat, the evacuation of the gut was extremely important so that the more primitive vertebrate could immobilize for longer periods of time, meaning it needed less oxygen. So when we talk about defecation in fear, fainting in fear, uh, these are all adaptive 
reactions and reflexes that we inherited from more ancient vertebrae. And they're, they have real functions in trying to preserve the life of the organism. The problem is that for humans, uh, basically, uh, passing out becomes potentially a risk for, for lethal risk. And that's why I believe the nervous system learns from that shutting down and then moves into using dissociation as its next step. So which is that the body maintains a degree of neuroregulation to keep the body functioning, but in a sense, dissociation now takes the mental aspects, the narrative away from the physical reality. So I sometimes wonder if things like brain fog, fog, you know, when you feel brain fog or you feel spaced mm. out, you know, or you, and I've, I used to think this was just normal or it was because I had some sort of gut issue or I had candida or something, you mm. know, which create, but then actually I thought, actually, no, it's because it always happens in circumstances when I'm feeling overwhelmed mm. and then I tend to sort of go offline and space out. And when I was reading your book, I thought, oh, okay, this makes sense now because essentially it's a form of, of self-protection where I dissociate from the reality which is overwhelming and just kind of space out. So it might not be that I have candida which is causing brain fog. It could be this dissociative state. But I guess the question is how do you know which is which? Well, and does it matter? Reverse, right. I was going to say, let's reverse that. Does it matter? Let, let, let's just say that in that state, your gut is not optimally working. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not getting the total feedback loop. And then ask the question that if you, if your body starts picking up more cues of safety, acceptance, and feeling acceptable, what are the, uh, and that narrative starts to become who you are. What is the embodiment and the embodiment in your gut? Is your gut now working better? Yeah, which is fascinating. And in terms of the the sort of microbiome, so I, I've been reading that if you have good microbiome and so a good balance of good bacteria in your gut, that mm -hmm. it actually helps vagal tone. Whereas if you have gut dysbiosis, which is a prevalence of bad bacteria in your gut, that it can actually damage vagal tone. It, would you agree with this? Well, I imagine it's true. I, I It's it's not my area, so I can't really tell you. But what if you have damage, you're going to be sending cues of damage Danger. through the sensory vagus. And that tells the brainstem when you're in damage, what is it saying? It's saying you're not safe. So the body then moves into this other physiological state. It's a signaling system. Think of the vagus, in this case, as being your surveillance system. So if you say that there's damage to to an organ within my surveillance system. Yeah, completely. You're right, your body's going to shift state. Yeah. And then in terms of inflammation, I mean, you know, you, if you're in a state of chronic stress, essentially that will create inflammation. And so what is the role of the vagus in terms of mediating inflammation? Well, I mean, I'm sure it's incredibly it, it, complex. but Well, it is, but metaphorically it's relatively simple. And that is both the... Uh, Ventral and dorsal vagal, vagal pathways have anti-inflammatory functions. It's as simple as that. And so if you think of the vagus, that motor part of the vagus, as having, uh, being part of a feedback loop that down-regulates inflammation. So it's not like inflammation is here, vagal function is here. It's part of this integrated system of uh, allowing inflammation to occur but then being able to turn it off. So if we think of inflammation as having positive attributes as well, but defensive ones, and the real issue is how long is the, are you, is the inflammation occurring? And that's where the vagal system can come back and downregulate it. And that's really interesting because so many diseases are about chronic inflammation. And yeah. you know, whether it's mental health or physical diseases, it's about sort of the, the cell danger response, which I know mm. Robert Navio was talking yeah. about, which is where you know chronic inflammation, it gets turned on. And so what you're saying is that the vagal system can actually downregulate the inflammation. Yeah. Okay. And how does it do that? Does it do that with sort of peptides or sort of anti-inflammatory molecules or... It actually, there are direct nicotinic cholinergic pathways of doing it. But if you go back to Navio's work, actually, he called me once, and actually, we're good friends, but he told me that uh, bacteria follow the rules of the polyvagal theory. That was our introduction. I said, what do you mean? 
He says, when things are good, they socialize and reproduce. When mm -hmm. things are bad, they hunker down. And when things are really bad, they implode, they die off. So they follow the three stages of how the autonomic nervous system works within polyvagal theory. And what he is really saying, these are in such general rules of living organisms, not just of the polyvagal theory. Interesting. That's fascinating. I think just one thing I just wanted to leave this on also was, was how you make a beautiful plea in your book from greater compassion um, in terms of, you know, how we treat our bodies, how we listen to our bodies. But also what I love is the fact that I, I came away feeling, you know, it's incumbent upon ourselves to make sure that we are regulated mm -hmm. and that we listen to our bodies, that we you know, are sensitive enough to the cues in our bodies to say, okay, we need a bit more regulation or we need to, you know, step aside and do whatever it takes to regulate. And that as a result of this responsibility that we take to try and better regulate our nervous systems, we can be better parents, better colleagues, better children, better partners. And to me, that was a really key takeaway from your theory, which was about, you know, becoming aware of our capacity to self-regulate and the importance of regulating our nervous systems for us to function more harmoniously as a society, essentially. Yeah, and I think it, it doesn't just start with our awareness of our ability to regulate. I think it starts with our, our ability to be aware of our dysregulation. Uh, of the ruptures that are, that create dysregulation and to respect those before we get angry at ourselves or angry at someone else and to realize that there are going to be many, many opportunities or I should say many disruptions or, or in, in our interactions with others but to think of disruptions as opportunities for repairs. So the issue is that there's nothing wrong with a disruption because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for repair. Which is fantastic. And just one final thing before I let you go. I know that you're working on a device that essentially helps to measure the nervous system called the PhysioCam. And I'm very interested in sort of the clinical applications of this and whether you think that it's something that can actually revolutionize or help revolutionize the way we treat mental health. And, you know, I don't know if you're at liberty to talk about that or if it's premature. Well, I, I would tell you uh, what, the, in a sense, the long-term plans are. I think the long-term plans are that it could be uh, useful in revolu revolutionizing how telemedicine is conducted because it can measure uh, through, it, through a webcam-like device uh, beat to beat heart rate with sufficient accuracy to measure the vagal regulation, but it can also measure uh, the pulse wave amplitudes, which are sympathetic. So functionally, you can tell a lot about the physiology and the dynamic shifts in physiology without contact. Um, but even more, sorry, even more than that, I, I think it can be uh, modified over time to measure pulse oximetry so that you standardize the, how the, the sensor works and you can actually measure oxygenization. So that's why I think it could move into telling medicine. And the, the question is, uh, what I, the actual uh, application I see is it kind of like, uh, we look at people and not everyone is really, well, I should say we're beginning to become more astute in understanding that we can detect from people's voices and their facial expressions their autonomic state. And that's where polyvagal theory gives you clues about what to look at. What the physiocam will do is basically validate your intuitions and you become more skilled at doing that. So in a sense, it unveils or takes the veil off our nervous system. And we can see our autonomic nervous system adjusting during dynamic situations. Which is great for therapy and teletherapy because you'll be able to essentially read your client's nervous system and then adapt accordingly. So yeah. it's, I mean. It's a, see, I would say you, what you do is you start to respect the fragility of, of another person's nervous system and not to create the narrative that what I'm saying shouldn't affect you or what I'm saying I think shouldn't affect you, but it may affect you in a way that I want to repair. So it might provide an early indicator of when the uh, 
intonation of the interaction needs to change. Because I think that's one key takeaway of also everything you've said in your book, which is that essentially we can be in safe environments which can seem safe, but as long as internally we don't feel safe, yeah. it makes no difference. What really matters is how we feel within, and no one yeah. else can, can tell. And so being able to measure that, I think, is, yeah. is huge. Yeah. Well, what we end up doing is uh, starting to believe the other person and not tell them how they feel. Exactly. And also, I think it's important for us sometimes in, 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 a, in a parallel way to trust what we feel and not yeah. let other people tell us, actually, you should feel fine if you don't feel fine. If that doesn't work very well. <laughs> it doesn't. Well, Stephen, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so, so much. And I have to say, I wish there were... There were more of you, and I, I wish there were, you know, I think you're such an enlightened, amazing human being, and I think your work is really changing the world, and I really hope that um, we can do polyvagal-informed therapy around the world, and, and it can really revolutionize the way we treat mental health, and it's absolutely fundamental that we incorporate this sort of understanding of the nervous system and its impact on mental health. So well, thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you for inviting me. It's been marvelous. By the way, this I'm still on the journey. I'm not there yet. I'm still trying to figure more of this out. Well, we all are, and uh, but you in particular, and you have many, many more years of working it all out, and you're clearly involved in some very interesting research projects at the moment. So, you know, bonne continuation, as they say in <laughs> French. Thank you. And keep safe and take care of yourself. You Thank too. you. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that your mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you may take to start your healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful. And if you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or check us out on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program. Thank you.